Um, I just um, wanted to welcome you all back to the second day of um, the Eyes on a Cure conference, and thank you all for coming back. I know yesterday was a really long day, but hopefully productive and meaningful. I know it was for me, so I hope it was for all of you, too. Um, and because today, today is a little bit of a special day, I know it's Father's Day, and a lot of you are fathers and are spending part of the day with us, so I thought maybe we could just ask all the fathers to stand up and... Uh, just thank you all and for being here and <laughs> so on behalf of your kids. Um, so we um, have, a re we're really lucky to have a good program this morning and um, we're starting I think with a, a really um, informative session. Uh, we're really lucky to have Dr. Dan Brown and Dr. Is it Rainy? Ronnie, sorry, Ronnie Ann from um, Thomas Jefferson here to talk to us, um, I think mainly about extrahepatic um, disease control, maybe a little bit um, additional information about um, liver disease as well. Um, so I will hand it over. And I think what we'll do is we'll have them each speak, and then we'll take um, questions and answers at the end. But they've both said that if they're using terms or anything that you don't understand during their talks, to please interrupt them um, so that they can explain anything that. Um, that you don't understand. So with that, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Um, as we bring my slides up, I just want to say thanks for inviting me. This is a uh, very important meeting, and I'm happy to help out. Can you guys hear me in the back okay? I guess if you can, mm -hmm. you won't know, but mm -hmm. okay. All right. Renee, can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Okay. Where's the, uh, this is my board? Yeah. The There we go. Okay. And this is, this is Pam. Okay. So I'm going to talk about uh, mostly about. Can you turn these lights off? Okay. All right. Can you see the slides in the back? Okay. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. I'll just put the whole room in darkness if I try to do that. So. Um, I'm going to talk about using ablation and uh, vertebroplasty, cementoplasty to treat focal areas of disease. Most of the talk yesterday, talks yesterday focused on disease everywhere and, you know, focusing on the liver obviously, but melanoma is typically a multifocal disease. Uh, so these techniques don't usually play a huge role. And I'm going to go through what these terms mean as far as tumor ablation and cement injection. If anybody does a Google search, I'm sure anyone going through this process spends a lot of time on Google, um, you know, you'll see these terms come up. And I'm going to explain a little bit about what they are and differences as far as the ablation and the uh, cement injections. And these are some of the organs that we've treated, uh, liver, lung, bone. We've also treated kidney, uh, just soft tissues, uh, you know, retroperitoneal masses. I'll go through a couple of those cases as well. So I, I'd be willing to bet that this uh, slide, these pictures were shown yesterday at some point. Uh, maybe more than once, but this is one of the reasons we don't do a lot of ablation in melanoma patients is, you know, anybody you think has a solitary mass often has multiple masses, and ablation is good for about one to three sites of disease at a time. Otherwise, it starts to become a, a little bit of a fruitless endeavor. Uh, and so you have to pick these patients very carefully, and we're very judicious in how we select them. Um, the first type of ablation that was described was radiofrequency ablation. This was actually performed as far back as the 1920s doing rhizotomy or nerve uh, kills. And the older ablation needles, you'll see here on the left. Oh, that's it? Okay. Whoops, that's not there. The, you see here, you don't, this is, a, this is an explanted liver, but you don't see a lot of uh, necrotic or dead tissue around this needle. So this isn't going to be very effective in someone that has a tumor that might be two or three centimeters in size. In the late 1990s, uh, different needle types and different uh, technologies were developed to allow us to, to um, treat larger areas of tumor. And the way this is done is by putting current uh, into the needle or the electrode, and then the current leaves the patient through grounding pads placed on their thighs. And the tumor cells kind of follow the ions in the current and it's kind of like rubbing your hands together. It starts uh, warming up, and at temperatures over 60 degrees Celsius, uh, death is instantaneous. Radio frequency can be very effective, and uh, death starts at 50 degrees Celsius, but at 60 degrees, that's, your, that's my target temperature, because that means whatever 
uh, is in contact at that temperature has died. And, and the zone kind of starts small at the tips of the needles and, and, and uh, coalesces. Um, this was the uh, latest and greatest thing for the better part of a decade, uh, but now it's starting to be supplanted by a new technology called microwave ablation. And this is uh, the system we have here called New Wave. And this also works by creating heat through friction, but it spins water molecules similar to a microwave oven that you have. The difference is that with a microwave oven, you have uh, power going from the outside in. And with a microwave antenna, everything comes from the center of this needle and goes out both directions. Um, one of the key differences with radio frequency ablation, the current that you put in, uh, if the tissues get charred, like, car like charcoal, literally like charcoal, uh, the current doesn't travel that far. So it's a limitation. You can't get as big an ablation zone. With microwave, that doesn't happen. It just keeps building and building a zone. So you can get a much bigger zone of ablation. That makes this more useful for us in tumors that uh, we used to see we treat. And then three months later, there'd be growth back at the edge of the tumor. So this is uh, becoming a more useful modality as uh, we talk. Now, the heat sink effect, I don't want to go into too much technology here. Um, but the blood vessels that are by a tumor, uh, we're trying to get the temperature really hot, 60 degrees Celsius. We all are at 37 degrees Celsius, more or less. So 37 degree blood going by um, actually does, keeps you from getting to a temperature that you want and get to kill the cells. I, I, I compare it to like trying to barbecue something and having the top off the grill. So um, this is the difference. These are uh, from animal models. And you can see these are blood vessels here with the arrows pointing at them. And you can see this is an RF ablation defect. And you can see that there's a gap here. You don't get a nice circle. Uh, and this is a problem when we try to treat tumors that have a lot of blood flow. And this is a microwave lesion. And you can see the blood vessels here are just kind of gone. You know, they just kind of get sucked, un sucked right into the ablation field. Uh, this is a, just a very brief video showing how the uh, differences in these fields are developed. This is time lapse. This is uh, in um, cow livers, I think. And you see the microwave on the left and radio frequency on the right, and the expanding light colored uh, tan area is the ablation zone. You can see how much more rapidly this develops. This means we can treat something faster. It means we can uh, treat a bigger tumor and uh, have to worry less about it growing back at the edges, because that's the hard part, is getting the very edge of the tumor. We want to kill the tumor and a little bit of a zone around it. And I think this kind of just shows the concept. Um, moving on to cryoablation, I'm going to start showing examples of cases. Uh, cryoablation freezes rather than heats. Absolute cold and absolute heat both will kill cells. Uh, we do it by pumping argon into the needles, not into the patient. Uh, the, the, one of the very nice, uh, attractive things about cryo is you can see the ice ball that gets created. You literally create an ice ball, and that tells you if you're getting enough kill, which you don't get with the other two technologies, you get real-time feedback, and also tells you if the ice ball is getting close to something you don't want to get into, and it can keep you out of trouble. Uh, this is an example. This is a kidney, uh, renal mass. And you can see here's before. There's the tumor right here. And this is a pretty sizable ice ball that we can see that we've created to, uh, to kill that tumor. And that gets back to what I was talking about. The tumor is a little hard to see on the left here. It's right about here. But you want to get the tumor and a margin around it so it doesn't grow back. And this, this is an effective way to do that. So how are we going to use this focal therapy in what is classically a multifocal disease? Um, one is a test of time. If you have very limited disease, you can treat and see if it's going to stay stable for a while. This is often done for people that you might be considering surgery. Uh, the other is refractory disease, which is the majority of cases that we've done here. Uh, people that have responded very well to either immuno or Y90 or chemoembo, and they have one or two areas that haven't responded, and patients that have very poor alternatives or, or extra hepatic disease as well. Um, this is pretty much the only test of time I've done in ocular melanoma or uveal melanoma. And this patient had a solitary metastasis here. Um, we treated this three years ago. And this is just the ultrasound guiding us to the tumor. Here's the needle going through and through the tumor. This was treated with radio frequency. And this is immediately afterwards. And this is th uh, 30 months later. Uh, this, this patient is uh, still alive. And uh, this area remained controlled. However, he eventually did develop other tumors. Now, with some tumors like colorectal or something like that, you might consider surgery, uh, surgery or resecting this. Uh, but given the fact that we know a lot of this is going to become multifocal over time, this, this can you know, prevent someone from having a huge procedure and, uh, and, and eventually develop uh, new disease. This is a uh, patient that um, David treated 
who had great response everywhere else with a solitary area. Here's a PET scan with this bright uh, hypermetabolic area uh, with tumor here. We, uh, I don't do much cryo in the liver anymore. We can talk about that later if uh, people want. Uh, but we were able to treat that, and you can see a big defect. She got chemoembolized uh, or immunoembolized the, uh, a day or two later, and at follow-up, we can see here we've been able to get a good result with the margin. Um, as far as limited alternatives go, um, you know, this is a very rare episode, in, and it's less than 1% in a, a recent series of 1,700 patients. But this patient had a solitary dominant uh, metastasis left, and it had multiple, multiple, multiple tumors, and the arteries became fatigued. And uh, with this solitary area, often these arteries will recanalize, but we uh, didn't have that option for this, and so we went ahead and ablated this. Uh, going in, I, I told the patient, we're not going to try to get all this. It's a very big tumor. I thought it would be dangerous to try to get it all. Uh, but you can see here the ice ball. Uh, Getting to the tumor, the edge of the ice ball is not lethal, so I didn't try to get this too big because I thought it might be a little risky. And, but at follow-up, this has shrunk down quite a bit, and we've been able to control it and, 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 and uh, debulk it pretty significantly. Um, one of the reasons I go to my, I've gone to microwave, like I said, it's harder to get a big ablation zone uh, with RFA, and it's much easier to get with microwaves, probably a more appropriate way to say that. This is somebody that um, had a lot of time spent trying to uh, get prepared for surspheres and had this one tumor in the left side, and it just wasn't responding to uh, any treatment that was offered. And came in, uh, we were able to target it with a combination of CT and ultrasound. Here's our needles, or electrodes, more accurately going right through the tumor. And it was necrotic at follow-up, but you could see the tumor here uh, with some methiodol still in it, and, and a very skinny zone of ablation side to side you know, front to back, a nice zone, but side to side, probably not as robust as we'd like to have. And this is more like what we're getting with microwave. Uh, this is not a uh, uvia melanoma patient, it's a patacellular carcinoma, but this is um, a much bigger zone of ablation, about a six centimeter zone of ablation, which we could never dream about with RF in uh, 10 minutes with uh, a very quick ablation, so it's quicker time. I, d I do microwave and RF ablations with anesthesia because it hurts. Um, I wouldn't want my mom to have uh, this done without general anesthesia, okay? Um, as this is just another example of a six, seven centimeter zone with microwave. Now, nothing's perfect, and one of the things you'll see here is this went back into the abdominal muscles a little bit, and it's almost, with the microwave, it's almost like trying to reel it in a little bit, which is a unique problem to have when you do ablations, because that's not the way it's been for most of my career. This is another example where we got really aggressive. This is a pancreatic carcinoma metastasis, and we got a uh, 9, 10 centimeter zone here. So we're actually doing shorter term, I'm ablating for shorter periods of time now than I was when I first started using this technology. Going outside the liver, um, one of the principal things we'll see is is a soft tissue or bone metastases. I use cryo on these because it, it's much less painful. This patient came to see us, and this is a CT scan because he was living prone. He could not lay on his back. He had too much pain. Um, and we cryobladed him, and the following morning when we rounded on him, uh, he was on his back reading the newspaper. It was very, very rewarding uh, to see that the next morning. Um, this is a um, uvia melanoma patient. Sorry, yes? Uh-huh. Oh, I'm sorry, that's a good question. So this is in the pelvis. These are your, uh, the, the hip bones, essentially, and this is close to the uh, tailbone. And uh, so this is kind of where you're sitting on when you're uh, sitting down. This is why he could not uh, sit or lay flat. When I did the consult visit, he was on his belly the entire time on the exam table, uh, could not lie on his back. And by the next morning, this had gotten much, much better. And this works quickly. Uh, again, it's, it's suited mostly to like one or two areas of pain. It's not, if you have pain in, you know, six, seven metastases, not a good thing, but if you have one dominant, this can be very useful. And um, again, this is the, uh, another patient with this here, and uh, we have a needle, a crown needle advance. And one of the tricks that we'll do, I talked about knowing the ice ball to stay out of trouble, is we put a second needle in here and infuse some saline and push this. This is colon right here. This is on the iliac bone or the uh, hip bones in the in the uh, along your side, and we we push the colon away with some sterile saline to to create a safe zone to do the ablation. So uh, we didn't have to worry about injuring the colon because that would obviously be a complication with uh, pretty grave consequences. I, I'm going to show uh, an example of just multifocal ablation. This is a 52-year-old female that was um, diagnosed in 2004, had surgery elsewhere in 2005. 
uh, came to Jefferson 2008, had multiple metastases in the rest of the liver and a single pulmonary metastasis. This was shortly after I arrived here. And the question came up about what to do about the lung metastasis, and we ablated this. Uh, I haven't talked too much about lung, but this is kind of what you want to see here. You have this kind of ground glass around the needle tips. This is a patient on her belly. Uh, the tumor is in the posterior aspect. And uh, came down for immunoembolization. but I think it was actually two days later. And um, immunoembolization was performed a number of times, and most of the tumors responded, but there was this one area in the caudate lobe that would not respond. And, and the reason for that is there was a small artery going to the caudate lobe, and so all the flow would just go out to the right side of the liver, so it was very hard to treat that area. Um, I treated this with cryo uh, because I wanted to see the ice ball here. You can see the stomachs nearby here. We wanted to be very sure and precise that we weren't getting our zone uh, too far out. And the ice ball here, you know, fills the tumor, but remember, the edge of the ice ball is not killing the edge of the tumor here. It's, it's zero degrees Celsius, which is, you know, like an ice cube. Um, but a couple days later, when uh, Dr. Gonsalves brought the patient back, you can see this tumor in the inflammatory response. This artery is much bigger than it was before. And this is an older arteriogram. We just wouldn't, you know, nothing would track down there because the artery is tortuous. It was very difficult. And one month later, this was very well controlled. And at five months, it had shrunk down to that size, not lighting up, good result. Um, and a year later, this is a year after the lung ablation. This is pre and post. You see a little bit of residual scar here, but that's kind of, that's a good sign. Because from that point down, it should shrink. It shouldn't get any bigger. So um, I'm going to finish uh, quickly just with um, vertebroplast, your cement injection. And what this is, uh, is injection of cement, literally. Uh, this is kind of cement that's used to hold hip replacements in place into the spinal bodies or other bones that are involved with tumor. Uh, the cement uh, is, it heats up as it hardens. It, it's very thick. We have to put pretty sizable needles into it. Um, but as it polymerizes, it heats up kind of like RF. It gets temperatures of like 60 to 70 degrees, and it kills a lot of cells. Uh, but importantly also, it, it's supportive, and it stiffens the vertebral body up. So a, com a compression, the bodies actually, if they have tumor in them, are weakened, and they can collapse. And this helps prevent that. Or if someone has had partial collapse and they have pain from it, uh, which is what we usually see this for, the pain should be better, and it should stiffen the body so it doesn't collapse further. One of the things you worry about is that the body will collapse all the way and push back on the spinal cord or something like that, causing a lot of problems. Uh, we can also do this in other bones. Uh, this is all tumor uh, down in the pelvis that we filled up with cement here. Um, we do a very um, you know, e thorough physical exam. This is a patient who had an obvious compression fracture. You can see these are vertebral bodies. This is like looking from the side. And this, this one obviously looks abnormal. However, this one as well, uh, this patient had a lot of pain over this one when we palpated. So we knew we had to treat two levels, not just one. You see our needles in place here. And this is the cement filling. And we want to get it in the front two-thirds of the vertebral body. Uh, it doesn't have to go all the way to the back. That's a little aggressive. And we want to see it go from side to side, going from the, this part here to about this part here. These are called pedicles, filling those up. And this is what it looks like on a CT scan afterwards. Uh, you may, see, this is the needle path you see going right back through there. We want to go through the pedicle here into this, so we've done a, a pretty good job of getting the needle in here. You may see some cement outside here. That's not really worrisome. That happens a lot. It's not a problem. This is in a little vein going back towards the spine. That's not a problem. What we don't want to see is it coming back around the, uh, the fecal sac or where the nerves travel because then uh, people can get pain or problems. But this kind of finding is all, is, you see it about 50 to 60 percent of the time and people generally do well. Response to this is usually very quick. Now, I've been talking about ablation. Why not do uh, ablation here in the spine? I get very nervous. Um, by the time someone, the upshot of this paper is by the time someone feels pain uh, or radicular pain or, or nerve-related pain from ablation, it may already be too late and there may be damage done to the nerves. So in the spine, um, I do cement only. I do not do ablation in the spine. I'm very nervous about hurting someone. And I think there's no evidence showing that ablation is better than vertebroplasty. Um, I think this is an appropriately cautious approach. Um, in people who have non-weight-bearing bone disease, say a rib um, or, or something like that, um, I'll do ablation because it's quick and it's not going to matter. Um, in in weight-bearing bone, when I talk about matter, what I mean is the risk of fracture uh, afterwards. In a weight-bearing bone like the hip, if you just ablate it, the, the tumor that's been killed is not necessarily strong enough to support your weight, and it could still have a catastrophic fracture. 
So I'll put cement in there as well to try to uh, support that bone so people can walk and be comfortable. They're not going to have a fracture. And this is an example of this. This is a patient that had a, uh, this is the acetabulum, this is the femoral head, and uh, this is the hip bone essentially. And this is all tumor here, right here. So if we just ablate this and the femoral head, which is normal bone, is just pushing up into this, it's going to be essentially mush and, and the, you could have a fracture, dislocation, bad trauma. So what we did in this patient, uh, we ablated it first because we wanted to try to kill as many cells as we could. This patient had previous radiation therapy, by the way. Um, put the, these are our needles we inject the cement through. The venting technique means I didn't want the cement to get into the joint space. So we injected the lower needle, allowing it to track to the upper needle uh, because it's the path of least resistance. And this is a technique I was told about by some friends at a different institution. Um, and injecting this, we filled up the space very nicely. You can see here we're done. This is a fancy CT reconstruction on our table. Uh, and this patient who came in in a wheelchair was using a walker a couple days later and then got physical therapy and was able to uh, have a much better uh, quality of, of life. So.